earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs but not every man's greed so said the father of our nation mahatma gandhi a very good evening to all dignitaries and friends gathered here on this wonderful day the world habitat day when the world reminds itself of the basic right of all to adequate shelter and the imperative need for building a roof over everyone's head this year this day is even more special for us indians as it happens to be the birth anniversary of the father of our nation mahatma gandhi who dedicated his life for the homeless and downtrodden people of our country ladies and gentlemen i am shri priya your mc for the evening i express my hearty welcome to you all to the latest edition of beyond square feet a lecture series conducted by us at homes every year to share insights on practical and sustainable techniques to make your home and the world a better place to live in an array of acclaimed architects of the country who have seriously addressed concerns regarding sustainability in the modern times and proved their mettle in inventing and installing innovative living solutions have shared their thoughts and experiences with us on this platform the lectures are conducted on world environment day world habitat day and world water day every year കേരളം നെഞ്ചിലേറ്റിയ പ്രതിബദ്ധതയുടെ സംസ്കാരം അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് ഓരോ വർഷവും ഭൗമ പരിസ്ഥിതി ദിനം ജലദിനം പാർപ്പിട ദിനം എന്നിങ്ങനെ മൂന്ന് അവസരങ്ങളിലായി പ്രഭാഷണ പരമ്പരകൾ സംഘടിപ്പിച്ചു വരുന്നു ഇതിന്റെ ഭാഗമായി ലോക പാർപ്പിട ദിനത്തിൽ ഗാന്ധി ജയന്തി ദിനം കൂടിയായ ഇന്ന് തലസ്ഥാന നഗരിയിൽ ഒരുക്കിയിരിക്കുന്ന ഈ പരിപാടിയിലേക്ക് ഏവർക്കും ഹൃദയം നിറഞ്ഞ സ്വാഗതം പ്രകൃതി സൗഹൃദ നിർമ്മാണ രീതികളുടെ ശ്രദ്ധേയരായ വാസ്തുശില്പികൾ ഈ പരമ്പരയിൽ നമ്മോട് സംവദിച്ചു വരുന്നു ഈ ഭൂമിയും ഇവിടുത്തെ അമൂല്യമായ പ്രകൃതി സമ്പത്തുമാണ് വരും തലമുറയ്ക്ക് നാം കൈമാറേണ്ട യഥാർത്ഥ ധനം എന്ന ഓർമ്മപ്പെടുത്തൽ കൂടിയാണ് ഈ പ്രഭാഷണ പരിപാടികൾ ഓരോന്നും ബിഫോർ വി സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ദ പ്രോഗ്രാം ഫോർ ദിസ് ഈവനിങ് ലെറ്റ് ടേൺ ആ മൊബൈൽ ഫോൺസ് ടു ദ സാലൻ മൂഡ് ടു എൻഷുർ ആ സെൽസ് എ വണ്ടർഫുൾ ലിസണിംഗ് എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് കൈവശമുള്ള മൊബൈൽ ഫോണുകൾ ദയവായി സൈലന്റ് മോഡിലിടണമെന്ന് അഭ്യർത്ഥിക്കുകയാണ് ഓൺ ദിസ് ഡേ ഓഫ് ഡെലിബറേഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഡിസ്കഷൻ ഓൺ ദ വൈസ് ആൻഡ് വെ ഫോഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ക്രിയേറ്റിംഗ് എ ഹോം ഫോർ എവറി വൺ ലെറ്റ്സ് ബിഗിൻ ബൈ ഇൻ വോക്കിംഗ് ദ ബ്ലെസ്സിങ്സ് ഓഫ് ദി ഓൾ മൈറ്റി ഫ്രണ്ട്സ് കൈൻഡ്ലി റിമെയിൻ സീറ്റഡ് ആസ് വി പ്ലേ എ പ്രേ ഓഫ് വീഡിയോ പ്രാർത്ഥനാ ഗാനത്തോടെയാണ് തുടക്കം
ഉത്തരവാദിത്വമുള്ള ബിൽഡർ എന്ന നിലയിൽ വൻ വിജയം നേടിയ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് തീരെ വാണിജ്യ സാധ്യതയില്ലാത്ത ഇത്തരമൊരു പ്രഭാഷണ പരമ്പര തുടർച്ചയായി സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുന്നത് എന്തിന് എന്ന് ചോദിച്ചാൽ അതിന് ഒരു ഉത്തരമേ ഉള്ളൂ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിന്റെ സാരഥി ശ്രീ സുനിൽകുമാർ ഒരു വടവൃക്ഷത്തെ ചെറിയ മുറിവ് പോലും ഏൽപ്പിക്കാതെ മാറ്റി നടുവാൻ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് കാണിച്ച സന്നദ്ധത മാത്രം മതി അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് പ്രകൃതിയോടുള്ള സ്നേഹം മനസ്സിലാക്കുവാൻ Let me request Mr. Sunil Kumar V, Managing Director, Asset Homes, to formally welcome the dignitaries and guests. In October 2, Loka Parpeda Dinamana. Ayrthi Tolla Ayrthi Anbatthi Aramudal, Sustira Bhavana Sangalpaddinna Prathanimuli Chodhi. Ella October Masom Adhyat Thinglaricha, Aikirashtra Sabha, Ajarichi Verinna, ദിവസമാണ് ലോക പാർപ്പിട ദിനം ഇത്തവണത്തെ ലോക പാർപ്പിട ദിനത്തിൻ്റെ സന്ദേശം എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് പ്രമേയം എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഹൗസിംഗ് പോളിസീസ് ഓഫ് അഫോർഡബിൾ ഹോംസ് എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഭാരതീയരെ സംബന്ധിച്ചിടത്തോളം നമ്മുടെ രാഷ്ട്രപിതാവിൻ്റെ ജന്മദിനം കൂടിയാണെന്ന് തൻ്റെ ഭവന സങ്കല്പങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ചും ഭവന നിർമ്മാണം ചെലവ് കുറഞ്ഞതായിരിക്കണം എന്നുള്ള ആവശ്യകതയെക്കുറിച്ചും മാലിന്യമുക്തമായ വാസസ്ഥലങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ചും പലപ്പോഴും മഹാത്മാഗാന്ധി അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ലേഖനങ്ങളിൽ എടുത്തു പറഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് നവജീവനിലെ തൻ്റെ ഒരു ലേഖനത്തിൽ മഹാത്മാഗാന്ധി ഇപ്രകാരം കുറിക്കുന്നു മെനി ഹൗസ് ഹോൾഡ്സ് ആർ സോ പാക്ട് വിത്ത് ഓൾ സോൾസ് ഓഫ് അൺനെസറി ഡെക്കറേഷൻസ് ആൻഡ് ഫർണിച്ചേഴ്സ് വിച്ച് വൺ വൺ ക്യാൻ വെരി വെൽ ഡു വിതൗട്ട് ദ സിമ്പിൾ ലിവിംഗ് മാൻ വിൽ ഫീൽ സഫോക്കേറ്റഡ് ഇൻ ദോ സറൗണ്ടിങ്സ് ഐ ലേൺ തേർട്ടി ഫൈവ് ഇയേഴ്സ് എഗോ ദ ലാവേറ്ററി മസ്റ്റ് ബി as clean as your drawing room i learned this in the west the cause of many of our diseases is the condition of our lavatory and our bad habit of disposing excreta anywhere and everywhere i therefore believe it is the absolute necessity and right of a human being to have a clean place for answering the call of nature and clean articles for use at that time in every dwelling unit ee bhoomiyile thanne ഓരോ മനുഷ്യനും സുരക്ഷിത ഭവനങ്ങളെ കാക്ഷിക്കുന്നവരാണ് സാങ്കേതികവിദ്യ തനതായി ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്തുന്നതും ഒപ്പം തന്നെ സുസ്ഥിര വികസന മാതൃകയിലുള്ളതുമായ ഭവനങ്ങളെ കാത്ത് ലോകമെമ്പാടും ഏകദേശം നൂറ്റി അറുപത് കോടിയോളം ആളുകളാണ് ഇന്നും പ്രതീക്ഷയോടെ ജീവിക്കുന്നത് ഇളന്തൻ നെല്ലിൻ്റെ മധുരവും ഇരുട്ടിൻ്റെ കുളിരുമെല്ലാം ചേർന്ന് നിൽക്കുന്ന ഈ മനോഹര സായാഹ്നത്തിൽ കേരളത്തിൻ്റെ തലസ്ഥാനമായ തിരുവനന്തപുരത്ത് വെച്ച് ഇത്തരമൊരു ചടങ്ങ് സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുവാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞതിൻ്റെ സന്തോഷവും ആഹ്ലാദവും ചാരിതാർത്ഥ്യവും ആത്മനിർവൃതി മാധ്യമമായിട്ട് ഞാൻ രേഖപ്പെടുത്തട്ടെ സഹസ്രാബ്ദങ്ങൾക്ക് മുമ്പ് തന്നെ വേൾഡ് ഈസ് വൺ ഫാമിലി വസുധൈവ കുടുംബകം എന്ന് പ്രഖ്യാപിച്ച മഹാസങ്കല്പത്തിൻ്റെ പിന്തലമുറക്കാരാണ് ഭാരതീയരായ നാമല്ല നമുക്കെല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരമ്മ നമുക്കെല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരച്ഛൻ നമുക്കെല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരേ ബന്ധുക്കൾ നമുക്കെല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരേ സ്വദേശം നമുക്കെല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരു വീട് ലോകമേ തറവാട് നമുക്ക് ഈ ചെടികളും പുലുകളും പുഴുക്കളും കൂടി കുടുംബക്കാർ ത്യാഗമെന്നതേ നേട്ടം താഴ്മതാൻ അഭ്യുന്നതി എന്ന് ഉച്ചയസ്ഥരം വിളംബരം ചെയ്ത ഭാരതത്തിലെ നഗരങ്ങളിൽ മാത്രം ഇന്ന് എക്കണോമിക്കലി വീക്കർ സെക്ഷൻ എന്ന് പറയുന്ന കാറ്റഗറിയിൽ ഏകദേശം മൂന്ന് കോടിയോളം ആളുകൾ ഭവനരഹിതരാണ് എന്നുള്ളത് വളരെ ഞെട്ടിപ്പിക്കുന്നൊരു യാഥാർത്ഥ്യമാണ് ലോ ഇൻകം ഗ്രൂപ്പിനെ കൂടി അതിലേക്ക് എടുക്കുകയാണെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ അടുത്ത ഒരു മൂന്ന് കോടി ആളുകൾ കൂടി ഭവനരഹിതരാണ് എന്ന വസ്തുത നാം മനസ്സിലാക്കേണ്ടിയിരിക്കുന്നു അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിനെ സംബന്ധിച്ചിടത്തോളം ഓരോ ഉപഭോക്താവിനോടും ഓരോ തൊഴിലാളിയോടും ഓരോ പ്രോജക്റ്റിനോടും നിലവിലുള്ള നിയമ സംഹിതകളോടും പ്രകൃതിയോടും ഉത്തരവാദിത്വമുള്ളവരായിരിക്കുക എന്ന അടിസ്ഥാന പ്രമാണത്തിൻ്റെ ഭാഗം തന്നെയാണ് സമൂഹത്തോടും ഉത്തരവാദിത്വമുള്ളവരായിരിക്കുക എന്നുള്ളത് ഏത് അടിസ്ഥാന വിശ്വാസത്തിന്റെ കാര്യത്തിലായാലും പ്രവർത്തനത്തിന്റെ ഒപ്പം വേണ്ട കാര്യമാണ് പ്രഭാഷണങ്ങളും ചിന്താശകലങ്ങൾ സംപ്രേഷണം ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ സംഭവിക്കുന്നത് ആശയങ്ങളുടെ വിലയിരുത്തലുകളാണ് നല്ല പ്രഭാഷകന്റെ ഓരോ വരിയും ഓരോ വാക്കും ഓരോ ആഹ്വാനങ്ങളാണ് ഇന്ന് ഈ വേദിയിൽ നിന്ന് ഉയരുന്ന ഒരു വാചകമെങ്കിലും ഇവിടെ കൂടിയിരിക്കുന്ന ആളുകളിൽ ഒരാളെയെങ്കിലും സ്വാധീനിക്കാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഈ പ്രയത്നം ഗുണകരമായി എന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു ബിയോണ്ട് സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റ് എന്ന പദം ഒരു നിർമ്മാതാവ് ഉച്ചരിക്കുമ്പോൾ തന്നെ അതിന് അർത്ഥ വിശദീകരണം ആവശ്യമില്ലാതായി തീരുന്നു എല്ലാ അർത്ഥത്തിലും ആ വാചകത്തിന് പൂർണ്ണമായ അന്തസ്വത്ത ഉൾക്കൊണ്ടുകൊ
വർഷത്തിൽ മൂന്ന് പ്രാവശ്യം ഇത്തരം പ്രഭാഷണ പരിപാടികൾ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് കഴിഞ്ഞ നാല് വർഷമായിട്ട് സംഘടിപ്പിച്ചു വരുന്നത് മാർച്ച് ഇരുപത്തിരണ്ടാം തീയതി വേൾഡ് വാട്ടർ ഡേ ജൂൺ അഞ്ചാം തീയതി വേൾഡ് എൻവയൺമെന്റ് ഡേ ഒക്ടോബർ മാസത്തിലെ ആദ്യ തിങ്കളാഴ്ച ഇത്തവണ ഒക്ടോബർ രണ്ടാണ് വേൾഡ് ഹാബിറ്റാറ്റ് ഡേ എന്നിവയാണ് ആ ദിവസങ്ങൾ ടുഡേ വി ഹാവ് വിത്ത് എസ് വൺ ഗ്രേറ്റ് സച്ച് പേഴ്സണാലിറ്റി പ്രൊഫസർ ഡോക്ടർ അമിതാബ് കുണ്ടു ഫ്രം ന്യൂഡൽഹി ആസ് ഓൾ ഓഫ് യു നോ ഹി ഇസ് ദ കറന്റ് ചെയർപേഴ്സൺ ഓഫ് ദ ടെക്നിക്കൽ അഡ്വൈസറി കമ്മിറ്റി ഓൺ ഹൗസിംഗ് സ്റ്റാർട്ടപ്പ് ഇൻഡെക്സ് അറ്റ് ആർ ബി ഐ ആൻഡ് കമ്മിറ്റി ടു എസ്റ്റിമേറ്റ് ഷോർട്ടേജ് ഓഫ് അഫോർഡബിൾ ഹൗസിംഗ് ഇൻ ഇന്ത്യ ബൈ ഗവൺമെന്റ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യ വിത്ത് ലോഡ് ഓഫ് പ്രൗഡ് ആൻഡ് റെസ്പെക്ട് ഐ ടേക്ക് ദിസ് ഓപ്പർച്യൂണിറ്റി ടു എക്സ്റ്റെൻഡ് എ ഹാർട്ടി വെൽക്കം ടു യു സർ ഏറെ ആദരവോടെ ഇവിടെ എത്തിച്ചേർന്നിരിക്കുന്ന തിരുവനന്തപുരത്തെ പ്രമുഖ പൗരാവലിയെയും വിശിഷ്യ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിന്റെ അഭ്യുദയകാംക്ഷകളെയും മുഴുവൻ സഹപ്രവർത്തകരെയും ഡിപ്പാർട്ട്മെന്റ് ഉദ്യോഗസ്ഥന്മാരെയും മറ്റ് പ്രൊഫഷണൽ അസോസിയേഷൻ ഭാരവാഹികളെയും പത്ര ദൃശ്യ ശ്രവ്യ മാധ്യമ സുഹൃത്തുക്കളെയും ഹൃദയത്തിന്റെ ഭാഷയിൽ ഞാൻ അസറ്റ് ഹോംസിന് വേണ്ടി സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു ഇന്ന് ഒക്ടോബർ രണ്ട് ഒരു നീണ്ട ഒഴിവ് ദിവസത്തിന്റെ അവസാന ദിവസമായിട്ടുകൂടി ഒരു കസേര പോലും ബാക്കിയില്ലാത്ത രീതിയിൽ ഈ ഹോള് നിറയുന്നു എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഇത്തരമൊരു വിഷയത്തോട് തിരുവനന്തപുരത്ത് പൗരാവലി കാണിക്കുന്ന വളരെ പോസിറ്റീവായിട്ടുള്ള പ്രതികരണവും അസറ്റ് ഹോംസ് സംഘടിപ്പിക്കുന്ന ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാമിനോടുള്ള വളരെ പോസിറ്റീവായിട്ടുള്ള പ്രതികരണവുമായിട്ട് ഞങ്ങൾ കണക്കിലെടുക്കുന്നു ബിയോൺ സ്ക്വയർ ഫീറ്റിന് തുടർന്നുള്ള എഡിഷനുകളിലേക്ക് നിങ്ങളുടെ എവരുടെയും ആത്മാർത്ഥമായ സഹകരണ പ്രതീക്ഷയുണ്ട് ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ സ്വാഗത പ്രസംഗം ഉപസംഹരിക്കുന്നു നിങ്ങൾക്ക് എല്ലാവർക്കും ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി സ്വാഗതം നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം Today we are fortunate to have amidst us Prof. Dr. Amitabh Kundu. Dr. Kundu is currently the visiting professor at the Institute for Human Development. He was a regional advisor on poverty at United Nations Economic and Social Commission for West Asia until August 2017 and consultant to the government of Sri Lanka on population census in 2016. He was professor of economics and dean of the School of Social Sciences at Jala Nehru University. He has been a member of National Statistical Commission and chairperson of the expert group on diversity index and post HR evaluation committee appointed by the Ministry of Minority Affairs. He has headed and been a member of several technical committees appointed by the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation and Ministry of Minority Affairs and has been a visiting professor at University of Amsterdam, University of Würzburg, South Asian Institute, Heidelberg, Germany, etc. Professor Kundu has worked as director at various institutes such as National Institute of Urban Affairs, Indian Council of Social Science Research and Gujarat Institute of Development Research. Currently, he is in the editorial board of Area Development and Policy, Manpower Journal, Urban India, Journal of Education, Planning and Administration, Indian Journal of Labor Economics and Indian Journal of Human Development. He has about 40 books and 300 research articles published in India and abroad to his credit. ഇന്ത്യയിലെയും ജർമ്മനി ഫ്രാൻസ് അടക്കമുള്ള വിദേശ രാജ്യങ്ങളിലെയും പ്രശസ്ത വിദ്യാഭ്യാസ സ്ഥാപനങ്ങളിൽ അധ്യാപകൻ കേന്ദ്ര സർക്കാരിന്റെ വിവിധ മന്ത്രാലയങ്ങൾ ഐക്യരാഷ്ട്ര സഭ ശ്രീലങ്കൻ സർക്കാർ എന്നിവ രൂപീകരിച്ച വിദഗ്ദ്ധ കമ്മിറ്റികളിലംഗം ഇന്ത്യയിലും വിദേശത്തും പ്രസിദ്ധീകരിക്കുന്ന നിരവധി ജേണലുകളുടെ എഡിറ്റോറിയൽ ബോർഡ് അംഗം നാൽപ്പതിലധികം പുസ്തകങ്ങളുടെയും മുന്നൂറിലധികം ഗവേഷണ പ്രബന്ധങ്ങളുടെയും രചയിതാവ് പ്രശസ്ത സാമ്പത്തിക വിദഗ്ധൻ പ്രൊഫസർ ഡോക്ടർ അമിതാബ് കുണ്ടു ആണ് ഇന്ന് നമ്മുടെ മുഖ്യ പ്രഭാഷകൻ Let me have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Kundu to share with us his insights on today's topic of discussion, Housing for All, Rhetoric to a Reality Check. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome <laughs> Prof. Dr. Kundu to the base. Friends, it's an honor and privilege for me to address this distinguished gathering of professionals, architects, planners, administrators, and social researchers also concerned citizen on this world habitat day i must say that uh, when i received the invitation from asset home mr sunil kumar perhaps knew that i have been working all along my career on housing for the poor and you know that the contribution of the private real estate sector in this bottom 
level of the housing has not been very significant, excepting a few companies. And he didn't ask for a typed copy of my presentations. He doesn't know exactly what I'm going to speak here. But I'm really uh, very impressed by the fact that with the social commitment, as at home is organizing this lecture series on contemporary developmental issues, keeping it apolitical, and raising technical issues of engineering, including social engineering, which would be beneficial for the region as also for the country. My professor, Amartya Sen, always said that Kerala remains ahead of the rest of the country. And I, he said, I wish we can go and settle down and see how things can happen, which doesn't happen in the rest of the places. But unfortunately, we do find some of the bad things which was happening in the rest of the country are happening in Kerala as well. There's something to worry about. But nonetheless, in terms of every social indicator, including performance in the housing sector, I'll give you a table. It's not my statement, it's the RBI, which says that they Honesty in the housing market is much higher in the southern part of the country than anywhere else. Again, as I said, it's a RBI data. Let me begin, as Supriya did rightly, by recalling a very significant statement made by Gandhi. I mean, Mohandas Karamchand, Gandhi, father of the nation, that... I quote, I refuse to live in a house, in other people's house, as an interloper, as a servant, or as a slave. The statement he made in the context of the nationalist movement, basically suggesting that India should be free from the British rule, but even the literal meaning of that sentence is something which is very, very significant which cannot be dismissed. You know, the dream of the dreams of all Indians is to have a house, which is not a matter of courtesy. It should not be a matter of mercy. It should be based on ownership. If you review the developments for the last two decades, keep aside the NDA, UPA politics, or the Kerala's politics aside, just review it dispassionately, you do find that housing for all not only has an emotional appeal, it has a political context, it has an electoral significance also. Major emphasis came on housing, I must say, in 2008 with the UPA government, interest subsidy scheme for the urban poor. Later came Rajiv Awas Yojana, you might have heard, Rajiv Rinna Yojana, which was again following. But after the massive victory, India victory in 2014, with the Modi wave coming up, you remember the first meeting, joint session of the parliament, President of India declared a major mission for the country of the India government, housing for all. Next year, 2015, the government launched PMAY, Prime Minister's Awas Yojana, with a seven years time frame, promising housing for all, with minimum level, the necessary facilities being associated with that. Now, I think, it would be wrong to say that housing is a dream only for the poorest. Even the middle class has a vested interest in this program, housing for all. You know, the middle class in India, if I can be frank with you, has developed the habit and also has the capability of cornering a large part of the subsidies and the benefits which are given for the poor. And obviously the middle class thought that they would have a reasonable share even in this PMAY. The upper class also had a vested interest in this. They thought this will make, if not the entire city, 
at least my colony is slum free. All those squatters who are sitting here, they will be taken up outside and I will have a slum free living. The environmentalists who work on the brown agenda, water supply, sanitation, they were happy. They thought all the unhygienic conditions associated with the slums would be not there. And I can certainly admit here, the real estate sector, the private builders lobby, were also very happy because, you see, the housing sector had a major shock with the Lehman Brothers collapsing in America. And you find in India, although the impact was not that bad, but still significant drop in the housing activity, which is shown with the red mark. And you find after 2012-13, there has been a significant decline continuously. And there was a feeling that there's a big bubble which is going to burst any time. Housing sector is going to collapse. You find in 2013, there was 25% just a second fall. With the announcement of the Prime Minister's Awas Yojana, you find that came down to 4% only. But again, demonetization has come in. It's affected the housing sector, but it's been predicted by many that if the Prime Minister's Awas Yojana comes in and if the private sector cooperates and comes to, takes up the responsibility of the affordable housing, housing sector will pick up and it will contribute to the overall growth of the national economy. Now with these diverse expectations of different sections of the population, I thought when I got the invitation from Dilip that I would Look at the rhetoric which is there and make a reality check on the basis of the limited data that I have available with me. I must tell you, information even after leaving in Delhi, and as Mr. Sunil Kumar mentioned, I have been in different committees of the government. Even then it's very, very difficult for me to get the data because they know that I always remain somewhat critical of the implementation, so they are not very happy sharing, but I will try to do a reality check on the basis of the information that I have. I'll make my presentation in five sections. First, I would look at the different components of Prime Minister's Awas Yojana. I know many of you are associated with the housing sector. You might be knowing it, but allow me to just elaborate a little bit about the five, you know, four components. They are called four verticals of the Prime Minister's Awas Yojana. Next section, I'm just giving these sections so that you can organize the arguments in your mind in a sequence. I look at the, in the second section, I look at the overall targets which have been set and say it is engineering wise, is it possible? In terms of social engineering, is it possible? Are the institutional arrangement been made properly to target the housing for those who need them? So we do a macro level checkup of the consistency. In the third section, I critically analyze the four verticals. As I mentioned, empirical evidence may be limited, but based on the stipulations, the guidelines, the kind of subsidies coming in, what are the requirements, and the changes that have been made in recent years, I would like to say whether we are moving in the right direction. It is not possible to predict by how much we will fail or by how much we will exceed, but certainly it is possible to predict the direction of movement, whether it is right or wrong. I mentioned there are four verticals under Prime Minister's Awas Yojana. Three of them are centrally sponsored schemes. They are implemented by the state level agencies and also the local level agencies. Funds coming from the central government, largely the state can also supplement. The fourth vertical is not a centrally sponsored scheme. It is a central sector scheme. The difference is that in the central sector scheme, state government do not come in the picture. The National Housing Bank, HUDCO, and the primary lending agencies, anybody can apply for the loan. You get a loan with an interest subsidy. You can go to the market. So the fourth vertical is extremely important because the government's role is limited. 
the person individuals can go to the market and they buy the houses which are standing or build the houses with the loan amount coming from the government at a highly subsidized rate now I would look at these four verticals somewhat critically and then quickly I will share my areas of concern let us look at it dispassionately independent of our ideological commitment to see are we moving in the right direction if not what could be the corrective actions and what kind of city will we, will we be creating if we do not succeed in providing housing for all can we make cities inclusive will the morphology of the urban structure change to an exclusionary mode of urbanization would the rich poor segmentation go up these are some of the thoughts which I would like to leave with you but let me tell you I've come with also a lot of expectation I would certainly like to learn from you as far as the ground reality is concerned you should be able to tell me when I ask the questions which I have in my mind unanswered you should be able to tell you give me the feedback so that I can go back to Delhi and examine them with greater empirical rigor am I speaking too fast is it all right thank you now what are the four verticals the first one is the slum rehabilitation program you know the total housing shortage has been identified by the government as 20 million and 18 million are in the slums understandably there has to be slum rehabilitation program it is an in situ program that means the land is not an issue land will be available so if the private companies are coming in the real estate developers are coming in land will be provided by the government it is the cost of production and for the cost of building one lakh of subsidy per unit will be made available selection of the private companies will be done on the basis of some criteria but certainly if the companies are willing I had talked to some of the senior officials he said it would be possible for us to get companies if they are willing to come in they will take up slum improvement and redevelopment not only in the public areas the slums on the public land but they will also take up in the private land and this will be done largely by involvement of the private real estate developers there is a possibility of cross subsidization the private companies which will come in they can get extra FSI and TDR if it is not possible in that area somewhere outside so that they can cross subsidize they can bring down the prices for the economically weaker section to a level that is affordable basically the issue is not just to produce the houses but to make the houses affordable to the poorer sections that is the first uh, vertical the second vertical is beneficiary led construction and expansion as I said large number of the poor and houseless live in the slum area but many poor I'm talking about urban areas only some of them live outside the slums in small little squatters or independent houses what would happen to them they can apply if they have title to the land to the local government with a building plan if it does not violate the city laws bylaws and fits in the city master plan they would be taken in the selection would have to be made and there is a possibility of discretionary power of the local government who will be selected and there is a possibility of corruption the moment you give that discretionary power but if there is no corruption it is possible that only those slums and those people will be selected who are coming in the way of efficiency of the city system like on the roadside railway station airport but real poor slums which are not blocking the city wise movement may not be taken up that's a fear but we'll discuss that little later so this is the second component poor who are living outside the slum areas the third component is public private partnership about which I think all of you know land 
will have to be mobilized by the private developers and you get a subsidy of 1.5 lakh per unit which is given to economically weaker section. When a private sector is coming in under PPP model, 35% of the dwelling units must be given to the economically weaker section and they will be sold on the basis of the prices which are determined by the state government. The prices will be determined by the state government, but that is only for the economically weaker section. As for the other 65% of the dwelling units are concerned, they will be you know, sold in the market at the prices fixed by the private developer. There is a great possibility of cross-subsidization in that. The last, as I said, all the first, second and the third are centrally sponsored schemes. The role of the state government and the role of the local government is significant. The last one is credit-linked subsidy scheme for the EWS LIG. That's how it started in 2015, but you must be familiar now from this year, in fact last year itself, for middle income groups also this program has been extended, the income limits have been raised, loan amount has also been raised. Basically, the amount of money will be given to the household. Household can choose to build a house or buy a house which is standing and uh, there is a limit on the total carpet area. Earlier it was the built up area, now they have said no, it is carpet area. For LIG, it would have to be 60 square meter. For EWS, it is 30 square meter. For MIG, it is 1910. We will discuss some of these. So these are the four verticals that have been proposed and that are being operationalized. Now, I move to the next section to do a reality check on the total projected figures of house construction and how that will be targeted to the poor houseless population. The total housing shortage which has been taken by the government is 20 million in the urban areas. Now, I ask this question. Is it possible to build 20 million houses within a period of seven years, 2015 to 2022? Now, the answer that I have is clearly yes. Look at the data for 2001 and 2011. Do you know how many houses we built? Without that much of government support, 26 million houses were built. The growth rate in the housing stock was much larger than the growth rate in the number of households. And that is the reason. Sorry, I have been really working with the government for a number of years. For the 11th five-year plan, I was chairing the housing shortage committee. We gave a figure of 25 million housing shortage. For the 12th plan, it has come down to 19 million. Because, you know, market itself catered to the, you know, poor households to a limited extent. So, I thought that if for 12th five-year plan it had gone down from 25 to 18, 19 million, they will remain at that, that level or may go down. But the government has taken 20 million. I think it's slightly on the higher side. But certainly, 20 million households are not standing under the you know, sky. This housing shortage does not mean that these people are on the street. Look at the projections that our committee has made and the government of India has certainly accepted these. This is the report that we submitted and look at the shortage. 15 million out of the 20 million is shortage because of congestion factor. Do you know what is a congestion factor as defined by the government? 15 million households are having more than three persons per room and there's a married couple which is sharing the bedroom with a person above 10 years of age which is not socially acceptable. That is the congestion factor. A married couple sharing a room with 
an adult. Now, these 15 million houses need not be built up. We estimated many of them need only an extra room or two rooms. The real shortage is here. Only some households where there is no scope for expansion, they need a house. We estimated something like 4 million out of this 15 million and remaining 5 million, you know, not more than 8 million houses need to be built for the poorer sections. Now that is the point. It is easier to meet the target at the macro level. Basically all that we need is 7 to 8 million houses targeted to the poorer section. It is not the engineering skill, it is the social engineering of targeting which is extremely important. I looked at the budget. Do you know how much is the allocation made by the central government under PMAY for producing these houses which is supposed to meet the target? 5,000 crore for 2016-17. 2017-18 Arun Jetli ji has made a provision of 6,000 crores. Now, if you have 6,000 and 5,000 up to 2022, I assume that they have to increase it. I take 7,000 crore every year. From 2015 to 2022, if 7,000 crore is given, you have 7,000 multiplied by 7, 49,000 crore, make it 50,000 crore. I'm making a very rough calculation. 50,000 crore for housing for the poor. I'm not talking about the housing for the middle class. Where I'm talking about these 7 to 8 million new houses to be built up. If you have 50,000 crore, each house government is giving a subsidy of 2 lakhs. How many houses do you produce? Simple calculation. You produce 2.5 million and nowhere near 7 million. I personally believe that with this much of allocation of the government of the housing for the poor, we were not going to be anywhere near that. And I have been arguing again and again, a recent article is coming in EPW, that government, if it wants to be serious about housing for all, has to increase the allocation from at least 12,000 crore every year, something like that, in that range. Then only we'll be in somewhere near six to seven million houses to be produced directed to the poor. So basically, I repeat again, it is not the technical engineering, but the social engineering. We can produce the houses, but you have to produce in a manner that becomes affordable. And that is the challenge for the private sector, because the PMAY envisages involvement of the private sector and subsidies being rooted. Imagine if 50,000 crore even I think it has to be 80,000 crore. If that much of money is coming to the housing sector and rooted through private builders, how much of impact can we make? You know, Indian economy has done very badly in the last two quarters, 5.7%. If housing investment can go up in the next year, that makes a significant contribution to income growth also. So I have been arguing that if housing investment can go up, it will make a significant impact on pushing up the growth rate. Now, quickly, let me critically evaluate the different components and get your feedback on these four verticals, because that, they are extremely important. The first vertical, again, look at, look at slum rehabilitation program. Can we take up all the slums for rehabilitation and development? Government has only plans for the notified slums and only 25 to 30 percent of the slums are notified. Remaining slums, it is extremely difficult for the government to get into those slums. Because notified slums, there is some legal provision which has been started. It is possible to do the land acquisition. Again, I was associated with another committee and I met the minister. I don't want to name the person. He told me Professor Kundu, we would like to take up all these slums as tenable. I said, but there are many you know, local bodies. He said, this slum is not tenable. He said, no, we should declare every slum to be taken up for development unless that slum is a threat to life. For example, if it's on the railway track, then you cannot make it tenable. If it is on a you know, river bank, they will be flooded. They should be non-tenable. But 
if there is no physical hazard and if it is not encroachment on the heritage site, then it should be tenable. I again worked for the government. I proposed and I said, yes, 90% of the slums can be taken up for redevelopment. But the government did not accept that. So, government is still stuck with the notified slums. And in the notified slums also, if it is a private land, there are legal issues. It is not easy to get the land. Because the promise under PMAY is the land has to be given free. Then only the cost calculations will be valid. I will do the cost calculation and I think you know the cost calculation per square foot much better than me. But I think it's not possible. In fact, the progress in the first vertical is so very limited. I couldn't get the data. How many slums are being taken up? It's only the notified slums within which we are operating. And as I said, that even if it is a public land, municipalities don't want to give up their land. Railways do not want to give up their land. So it's not that easy to say, if it is a public land, we take it up and do for slum development. There has to be strong political will. And the report that I submitted to the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development said, unless the government says, all these slums which are not posing physical hazard to the people and not in the heritage site should be declared as tenable and should be developed. Second, the beneficiary led construction. Now the poor person who has a shanty or lives in a squatter may not have the papers. If you do not have the papers and if it is conflicting with the building laws and bylaws, you are out in any case. And it has to be fitted. The second component, you will be allowed to really develop your plot only if you have a legal title and it fits in the master plan. I think this will be certainly a method of sanitization of the cities, the areas where the poor people are squatting. If they are required for movement, better movement of the traffic, they will be taken up. And I have a feeling that this is the component which is going to be worst hit and not many private sector people have come in this beneficiary led thing. Third component promises hope, which is public-private partnership. Now this is a question on which I would like to hear from you. Is it possible for the private builders to develop a plot? 35% they reserve for EWS category, which is 30 square meters carpet area and price it in a manner that poor EWS household can afford it. Now you must remember private company will get 1.5 lakh for each EWS unit but that EWS unit is not then allowed to apply for a loan. You can't be a beneficiary in two different schemes. If you are being covered under public-private partnership, the prices of the dwelling unit for the poor would have to be such that it is affordable. With the land cost, my rough calculations tell me, and I would like to be enriched by your experience, 4 to 5 lakhs, if you make it beyond that, it would be extremely difficult for really target. You can produce those houses. There will be people who will take it. But are we really addressing to the poorest section? So that is an issue on which we have to do exactly what the lecture series wants us to do. Go beyond square feet. I was just talking, I remember, with Kumari Shailaja was the Minister for Urban Development. I argued with her that is it possible to bring down from 300 square feet uh, feet or you know 30 square meters to 25 square meter or 20 square meter. I was discussing this morning with Dilip that is it possible to provide in 200 square meter a house in which a couple and an adult can share with reasonable amount of privacy. That is an issue. I was talking to Mr. S.K. Das. I said is it possible? He said it is possible to bring down the cost. You know if you have to Provide the houses at 3 and 4 lakhs. You have to make some compromises. Best is the enemy of good. Kumari Shailaja always argued, Professor Kundu, you know, that will not be politically acceptable. We cannot bring it down to below 300 you know, square feet. 
and no, our government will be maligned. I said, you are aiming for ideal, but by that you build the houses, but they do not go to the poor because they cannot pay the installments. They can't pay EMI. They move out of the house, they again go back to the slums. What some architects were suggesting that is it possible to provide a common toilet which brings down the cost significantly for five or, five or six households together. So I think there is a lot of, this country is full of intelligent people who can do better designing. Is it possible to bring down the cost? I'm not worried about the total housing stock which is going to be produced, but can we make it affordable to the poorer sections of the population? And for that, some amount of social engineering and some amount of architectural redesigning would be required. I come to the fourth vertical credit-linked subsidy. This is the one which has undergone maximum changes ever since it was announced. It was announced that it is meant for... By the way, let me start from interest subsidy scheme of the UPA government. It said any household which has annual earning of 40,000 will get 1 lakh loan. Now, the household which is getting 40,000 per year, that means 3,500 rupees per month gets a loan of 1 lakh even with 5% interest subsidy. Do you know what is the EMI? It's something like 1,200. So nobody took it. That was a miserable failure because 1 lakh doesn't produce a house, first of all. And secondly, a poor who has 40,000 per year can't pay the loan. Rajiv Avas Yojana and Rajiv Rin Yojana said, no, it is 1 lakh, but only for those who have 1 lakh of earning per year. That means 9,000, 10,000. So if a household is getting 9,000 rupees, can pay 1,200 as an installment because loan amount was 1 lakh. But 1 lakh is not enough for housing. Again, there was no taker. It was a non-starter. Rajiv Rin Yojana was a non-starter, UPA government's program, and also was the interest subsidy scheme. Comes... PMAY of the NDA government, they announced 3 lakhs as the loan amount and any household which has less than 3 lakhs of yearly earning will get it. Now the issue is 3 lakh is not enough for a house and really the poor households for whom this program is meant do not have any other money excepting the loan amount. Three lakh, I'm sure all of you ag will agree, will not be enough to produce a house if you include the land cost. So we have had discussions. He said land cost will not be included because slums in situ upgradation and whenever some state is getting money under PMAY, Prime Minister's Awas Yojana, will have to provide land free of cost. If you provide land free of cost, and make it 300 square feet, then it could be possible. But as I said, first, second, and third, the land is not coming up. I visited state after state, they said, sorry, land is not available. So if you depend on this private-public partnership, is it possible to include land and make it available? I was looking at the you know, brick stones and all the other sites I found in Delhi, far about 20 kilometers away from the center, there is a flat available with 350 square feet carpet area and 600 as built up area being sold for 8 lakhs. Now this is an issue. If the moment you make it more than 4 to 5 lakhs, it may be beyond the capacity of the poor and it will just slip out of the hand. That's my concern. I would like to share this with you that if you want to take this big opportunity and I have a feeling that the government will increase the component of its intervention because housing can also help in economic growth to take place and housing for all is going to be a major flagship mission on the basis of which 2019 elections are to be fought. Is it possible for the private corporate sector and you know, private builders lobby to take up this challenge. He said, yes, those who have 
a corporate social responsibility built into their functioning. He said, yes, we have to take this challenge. We will work out some social engineering, cross-subsidization, perhaps look at the you know, design, provide the required privacy and also the provide required space. And I don't know how the joint uh, sharing of the toilets can work, but this solution has to be brought in. If I can have another five to ten minutes before we open up for discussion, is that okay? Another five minutes? I just wanted to share my concerns with regard to some of the programs and how we can rectify. You see, this is an interesting table. This gives LIG an economically weaker section, the total amount of subsidy which is given upfront. As you take the loan, the subsidy amount is given to you. This is shown there and the eligibility conditions are also mentioned and the total amount of loan that can be given has also been mentioned. Let me tell you that initially it started with 3 lakhs of loan. It has been changed to 6 lakhs. EWS category also can apply for 6 lakhs. Now with the entry of the middle class, it has been increased to 12 lakhs as the loan amount which can be given under the CLSS credit linked subsidy scheme. You know why this has been done? I told you Rajiv Awas Yojana failed because 1 lakh is not enough. They made it 3 lakhs. They realized 3 lakhs is also not enough. And who will take these 3 lakhs? The people who have got 3 lakhs of earning, they were not coming in. So it didn't, for 2015-16, there are not many takers. Government wanted to make this program succeed. They said, we have to see that this takes off the ground. People should apply for loans. They should take the loan. So they made all kinds of relaxations. As, I, as you see, that the total amount of loan was increased from 3 lakhs to 12 lakhs. The income slabs were also relaxed. For, for the EWS category, if you have 3 lakhs of earning, you are entitled to the subsidy. For 6 lakhs, for the LIG category, uh, the amount is 6 lakhs. And for middle income group, the amount of loan is much higher. There has been relaxation also in the area of construction. Earlier it was 30 square meter. It has been made to 60 square meter. In most of the states, they are saying they have to implement. They said 30 square meter is not acceptable. It is 50 square meter. And Orissa, I know, has accepted 50 square meter. West Bengal also, they are taking 50 square meter. So there is a relaxation. And that is how this program is becoming uh, you know, popular because the area constraint has been removed. Income constraint has been removed in any case because Arun Jetri did mention that even with Aadhaar card system, you cannot ascertain the income level. Loan amount has been increased. How the loan amount has been increased from 3 lakhs to 6 lakhs to 12 lakhs. Now, suppose you have a loan of 40 lakhs. Are you entitled for a subsidy? Yes, indeed. You can still get a subsidy up to 12 lakhs. Which really means you get a subsidy of 2.3 lakhs in any case. No matter how big is the house. And for the middle income group, the area is 110 square meters. With all these relaxations on the you know, area, carpet area, Earlier it was built up area, now it has been made to carpet area, the loan amount being increased, income slab being relaxed, and as I mentioned, 30 square meter for the EWS is to apply only for the metropolitan cities. Go out of the metropolitan city, it is 50 square meter. With all that, there is one good news coming. This has picked up. This program has picked up, and there are many applications coming up. But we have to ask how this has happened because we have brought in the middle class we have brought in the middle class and middle class knows who are buying houses for 30 40 lakhs they can still get 2 lakhs of subsidy from here right so the issue that comes to my mind the apprehension that comes to my mind that we are making this program work 
बट आर वी टारगेटिंग द हाउसलेस आर वी टारगेटिंग द इकोनॉमिकली वीकर सेक्शन आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू टेल यू शॉर्ट स्टोरी दर वॉज अ यंग प्रिंस हु वॉज इन लव विथ इज वाइफ एंड सडनली शी डाइड द प्रिंस शट हिमसेल्फ फॉर कपल ऑफ इयर्स देन वेन ई केम आउट ही सेट आई मस्ट बिल्ड a beautiful structure in her memory in the middle there will be casket silver casket with all ivory things my beloved will be there and he designed a beautiful structure but he was not happy he changed the structure no every time he will come and look at it he made changes he added many things and finally after 10 years he was very happy he said oh this structure is perfect but one thing is wrong the casket doesn't fit in the casket has to be removed otherwise the building is useless so please remove the casket now i'm just telling this story that we are making the program work by making these relaxations are we diluting our concern for the houseless and the poor population and the slum dwellers sorry i'll take another 3 minutes with your permission i just want to share my concerns with you Mr Venkaiah Naidu as the minister for urban development had announced the program for urban pmay is only for the statutory towns the non statutory towns which are declared by the census do you know how many statutory towns are there 4041 total number of towns are 7000 something so those 3500 towns will not get the benefit and the rural pmay has a very small amount registrar general of india says that these small towns non statutory towns are worse than the slums it is the official declaration of the registrar general of india they are excluded just give me two more minutes huh? and they are very successful in southern states and western states in the poorer states northern states eastern states there the Prime Minister Awas Yojana is not. It's the, basically the poverty which is not making them click. And I will show you a graph perhaps later in the discussion where South Indian, uh, uh, you know, registration rate is much higher and there is much better, greater compliance. Third point that strikes me that with this formalization in the housing market, we have given up the earlier approach of site and services scheme, wherein you gave a plot of land, gave the facility, then the poor people who cannot even take a loan of one lakh. or 2 lakhs they could incrementally build in so we tap their resources hidden resources of labor from them that model has been given up we are doing formalization which may lead to exclusion of the poorest of poorest section and that is a fear that we have and look at the what happened to this this is signal coming from the audience <laughs> no basically no no just go up go up acha i have to go up you see can you imagine the ews person and this is so absurd and similarly in the among the middle class if we are taking the smaller loan 9 lakh loan you get 1.73 lakh subsidy but if you get a larger loan if you have more capacity to take larger loan you get a greater subsidy the total amount of subsidy i am talking about you know a person who uses 10 liters of water a day gets a subsidy of 2 paise but total subsidy is less somebody is using 400 liters and gets 1 paise subsidy per liter gets a much larger subsidy this is what is happening i mean i find it so absurd and what is happening as a result of formalization and opening up the housing scheme for the middle class there is a process of exclusion i will just quickly go over that you see this is going us giving us the percentage of urban population which is increasing but this line is giving us the growth rate which has gone down rate of growth of urban population has gone down from 2.5 to 3.5 percent growth rate of delhi mumbai take any metropolitan city except in two cities puducherry <coughs> and bangalore because of the 
expansion of the cities. All the cities have experienced a decline in their growth rate of population. The exclusion of the poorest sections of the population in the urban areas. Look at the adjusted growth rate, earlier growth rate, unadjusted, because you know there is some reclassification which takes place. You find a significant decline in the urban growth rate which is taking place. This is the graph for migration. Despite what Arvind Subramaniam has said in economic survey, you do find migration rate is remaining constant or slightly going down for the men. For women, it has gone up. I just quickly want to. This is the World Bank's figure showing how the rate of growth of urban population is declining in India because of you know, all these kind of a elite capture of the urban space through these policies. And these are the figures which are the United Nations projection for India. Why so many light blue lines? All the light blue lines are giving the projection of urban growth rate given at different points of time. This is the growth rate during 2025-30. India's urban growth rate as projected is declining because of the exclusionary urbanization because the poorer sections are not coming in. You might be you know, having a vision from the media coverage that urbanization is bursting out. Look at the growth rate in the, any UN document. You do find that Indian projection of urban growth rate is much less because cities have become exclusionary because of this kind of a policy bias. We have to think about it. India has to expand its balanced urbanization, sustainable urbanization, not based on only big cities, but you have to take out the facilities to the rural areas as M.A. Kalam had mentioned, take the facilities through the small and medium towns to the rural areas. We have to worry about such policies which are ex creating exclusionary urbanization and strengthening, you know, weakening the power of the poorer sections and strengthening the upper and the middle class. These are the questions and I would certainly like to hear how the people who are working at the ground level with a social concern can help in making the cities inclusive in making sure that the poorer households are having an access in the major investment which is being made by the government. I do not want, in the name of the poor, you make such massive amount available and that is not really reaching the targeted sections of the population. That is my plea and I would certainly like to hear your comments. Thank you for your patience. Now the floor is open for questions. We will come to you. You can raise your questions. Any feedbacks, suggestions, queries, comments are welcome. Please introduce yourself and raise your question. Sir, can you compare uh, India's uh, projects with what really happened in China in the last uh, two, three decades? Uh, how do you compare that and can we learn some lessons from China itself on this? Uh, frankly, I have looked at the Chinese data on housing, uh, but you know, it may not be appropriate to compare two countries with a completely different kind of a political regime. Why I am mentioning, I was in Beijing for launching of the BMW car, which was an electronic car. You have heard Nitin Gadkari has said by, 2000, by 2030, there will be no petrol vehicle. There will be no petrol vehicle. Yes. It was announced. I was representing India and I said, I don't think it is possible uh, in India to really go in for electronic cars. And BMW was launching its first major initiative. Do you know in five years, China has done tremendous wonders. They have just banned it and banned it. You know, they, no petrol driven car can go to the heart of Beijing city. So their growth rate of the electronic car is something like 30% per year. Whereas India has not been able to do it. In the housing sector also, in the <coughs> you know, 60s and the 70s, housing sector was not doing that well. But then, for the last 30 years, they just made massive construction. And if you create localities outside the major metropolitan cities, people are forced to go. They go. And there is a hukou system. You know, hukou system does not allow the rural population to come to the urban areas easily. So there is daytime population is much higher. The floating population is something like 30%. So I have a feeling that in the Indian context, we can learn from many other Asian countries which have done 
wonders with regard to provision of housing. Poland is one country that I have studied and they were able to build up the dwelling units. I think to answer your specific question specifically, I would like to know, is it possible for our builders, private builders and the real estate sector to do a mass production of houses with 300 square feet or even 200, 250 square feet, do a mass production and government will buy it. I was once sitting with a large number of representatives from the private corporate sector and Kumari Shaleja was with us and they all asked, Madam Minister, tell us, we can produce these houses. What are the constraints that you will impose on us? This is the question that the private builders asked the minister. Minister looked at me, he said, how do you like to answer? I said, Madam, you should tell them that instead of that, we would like you to produce these kind of houses. What are the facilities that you want from us? The government should not be imposing constraint. Government should tell them the problem is to build houses with 300 square feet or 250 square feet. Can you produce them? And what facilities do you need? Now that's an issue. If you produce 200 square feet houses, you may be not be able to sell them because those who can afford would not buy these houses. And those who can buy the houses, they don't have money. So how do you solve this issue? I mean, I, I do not know what would be your thinking. But certainly I believe it should be possible to uh, follow the examples of, for example, Poland, which they did it in a massive scale, they constructed houses. And in uh, uh, 2008 or 9, they had to demolish many houses because they did overproduction. Right? Uh, uh, government should take up the matter and uh, they should take the uh, programs to the poor people. Those are unaware of all these schemes. And also, uh, if a poor approaches a financial institution, they just drive away them. That is the problem. That should be addressed first. Okay. Huh? Awareness is not created. Public awareness. Huh. Public awareness about these programs, these programs is not there. there are, nobody knows there are such schemes are available. Uh -huh. e even in, in banks, those who are sitting in there to sanction these loans, they are also not aware. They know only the bank schemes. They, they are not interested in the government scheme. They, one, in one case, I have just taken up the matter with a branch manager. I told, see, this is a scheme. You help them. These are the, the normal uh, income level is not required for granting such loans. They are not aware of it. This is certainly a big worry that I am carrying in my mind. If in a gathering where large number of representatives from the private builder sector is there, say the awareness about these subsidized schemes are not there, then certainly it's a matter of worry because so much of money. By the way, I looked at the data, number of houses sanctioned, num uh, amount of loan sanctioned, which is very small. I entirely agree. But still it is higher in the southern states compared to Bihar and Orissa and Madhya Pradesh. But so there is, even there the awareness is still less. Now in case of Delhi, I can tell you, Mr. our chief minister decided that I will not take any money under this because he perhaps he didn't want to give the credit to the central government so that was a position he took he knew about it but recently I heard that he has uh, it has been possible for Mr. Sisodia to take some money under the program so I think on this one should ride, rise above politics after all it is money which is available to all the states why should 50 I mean in fact you are right last year I mentioned the sanctioning was 5,000 crore. The total amount was not spent. This year it is 6,000 crore. Now, I was suggesting that it should be 12,000 crore. If there is no awareness about the programs, that such subsidies are available, then obviously you are not going to reach the target in any case. What is the status of the landless homeless? In the, uh, you know, uh, I worked in the urban areas. and any, any area? Uh, uh, I, I can tell you, that when we were estimating the total housing shortage, we had four components. One is those households where there is a congestion, that means more than three persons per room and an adult sharing uh, with a married couple. And that comes to 15 million. Then we took dilapidated houses, houses above 60 years of standing and in a bad condition, which is judged by the census. They are about two, three million. 
then kacha non-serviceable houses. In urban areas, then we ask the question, how many of them are totally shelterless, who don't have any shelter? And that, unfortunately, is not very high. I mean, at least the recorded thing is less than one million. I tried to verify the data by talking to civil society organizations. That official data says in whole of urban India, all states together, the number of persons who are absolutely shelterless, who sleep on the pavements, are only less than one million. I talked to Spark. I don't know whether you know about this organization based in Bombay, Sheila Patel. She gave some documents and she agreed that, well, absolutely shelterless people will be not more than one, one million. So that is the estimate that we have given in our report. You can Google and get it, uh, the housing shortage committee. That's a real concern actually. Landless homeless is a real concern. Uh, when we are talking about housing for the poor and uh, maybe eradication of slums or uh, upgradation of slums, we are still having slums. Even in Delhi, Bombay, everywhere we have slums. And is it a slum eradication program or is it housing for the poor? Because if you're talking about housing for the poor, we have, I mean, millions staying in slums. You know? They would love to stay in slums uh, itself. I mean, they don't want to move away from there. Maybe because of the locational advantage, maybe because of the address, maybe because of something else, you know, their job. Uh, how are we going to address that particular issue? Uh, you talk about Kerala, we uh, targeted, I mean, the figures were uh, two lakhs, you know, landless and homeless. Uh, but uh, personally, I don't think two lakh people are there, uh, landless, homeless. Maybe they take from, I mean, uh, people, MIGs, maybe uh, upper class also, they renovate their houses, you know, 100 year old house, 60 year old house. And why can't we do some programs to upgrade the slums, you know? by better uh, living conditions and better sanitation facilities, uh, better planning, you know, not, not by building. No, I think, uh, you know, I remember for Kerala, the figure of landless, houseless in urban areas, as officially reported to us, is less than 3 lakhs. You mentioned uh, 10 lakhs. So total adds up to less than 10, you say 2 lakhs. Okay, so that, that's the official figure. So total adds up to less than 10 lakhs, or less than a million. Now, the point is, there is a very high percentage of slum dwelling population. And they don't want to shift, as you rightly mentioned, because of their employment reasons or they have already developed some linkages. The government decided that, yes, that should be recognized. And as I told you, when I was asked to chair that committee, to decide about tenability, I said, all these slums, which are not posing any physical threat, should be taken up for redevelopment. And the government has given, for 18 million slum dwellers, the slum rehabilitation scheme. So what you are saying is exactly what the plan is proposing to do, is not to shift them. 18 million houses, household will get this shelter there itself, Please, private companies should come in. Real estate people should come in and build houses for them. And for building that, they will get a subsidy of one lakh per household. And if that is not enough, they will give extra TDR somewhere outside the city. In, in Trivandrum, you do the activity of slum development. You get, you know, TDR, transferable development rights elsewhere. But still, as I said, people are not coming in. We'd like to know what is constraining in the private corporate sector to come in. And that's the question they were asking the minister. That what restrictions private corporate sector will face from the government. I said, let us put this. What facilities do you need? You please come into the slum areas, take one lakh of rupees, build houses, do cross subsidization, take extra FSR and do this. Why this is not coming up? Mr. Sunil Kumar, what is your assessment? How come not many private developers are coming to the slum areas even with this kind of a subsidy and with the promise? You see, I do not know. Suppose there are 5,000 households in a slum area. You take that land. Is it possible to put them into two-storied structures or three-storied structures 
and still have some extra space to cross subsidize. I know Sheila Patel in SPA in Mumbai, she took part of Dharavi, she went up to four stories and I think built something like 1,200 houses, at least 300 houses she had extra. She could sell that and compensate. Is it not possible for the private corporate sector to come in and say, yes, we will do slum development, we'll take your money and we'll create extra space, we'll subsidize and we'll deliver the houses to the poor. Pardon me? Uh, area? Area. No, no, that, that government has mentioned that the state will negotiate and give the extra no TDR. Official, no, no official has said this to any of the builders. Uh, I, the I'm simply saying it should be pursued with the state government that here is the governmental program. If you are serious about it, get that one lakh rupees from the central government, give it to us and give us the extra TDR. We should be able to you know, meet the ob objective. This is the major challenge which the country has taken of providing housing for all. Let us for cut across our politics. Let us take up the slum developmental programs in a manner that we can really target the sections. You don't need land to purchase land because land is available. You are, you are using, making in-situ development. Only cost of construction has to be given and that has to be subsidized in a manner that these poor people are able to live there. Beside one lakh which is coming from the central government, state government can put in extra money also. That's also, there is a provision. So how come this is not taking off? This is the worry and I really thought that I will get some suggestions. Maybe you can write to me also saying that, well, perhaps this can be. I still have some friends, some secretaries, joint secretaries, and sometimes I also meet the ministers, although they don't listen to me. But I can pass on this suggestion that how come the first three verticals are not taking off? The fourth vertical is taking off basically because you have allowed the middle income people to come in and they are in a position to, you know, buy the, take a loan of 50, 50 lakhs, 2 lakhs of subsidies coming. So why, why should I not take it? Mm -hmm. And uh, in 50 lakhs, you get a, uh, you know, reasonably uh, two bedroom house so it's the middle class which is really making the program successful and really it's not being targeted yes ma'am so the sites and services scheme which was implemented in uh, chennai by the housing board that was really actually a success that is uh, in arumbakam they had uh, we had also gone for uh, an evaluation scheme for that so it was really successful but the thing is the management side that is what we have actually have to put in our effort so that scheme was really successful there. Ma'am, I think you are making a very significant point. Under the present regime, there is no scope for site and services. It's all ruled out. You see, earlier, under site and services, you are given a plot of land, some basic infrastructure, and you allowed the houses. The poorest household who could not even take a one lakh loan are still able to build up over a period of five, six years some kind of a structure. Now, if that is not there, what, what can the private sector do there? Should we pressurize the government to say, no, let us have some kind of an informality. Now, government is going for formal housing, house building. And formalization would certainly strengthen the exclusionary trend. The poorest of the poor who cannot take any loan would not be in a position to get the houses. So that is one concern that I have, and I do not know how to solve it. In the slum areas, there are tenants who are not owning any land. They have to be also accommodated. You know, you can't get rid of all the tenants in the, in, in the slums and say that you find for yourself. So these are, I think this is an important issue which I should be able to raise with the government saying that why not you allow the initiative of the poor households to bring their own hidden resources of labor and capital over a period of six, seven years and build houses for themselves and start by giving site and services. Yes, you wanted to ask something. For uh, achieving housing for all by 2022, what do they expect? You showed four verticals. Yes. What is the share expected of e each one of these verticals to achieve the target by 2022? That is, uh, you said that three of them are not taking off. One is only taking off. That's the fourth vertical. But uh, it may be some, uh, uh, there will be a percentage of share or equity required in each so that you achieve the goal. I think this is a question coming from a real researcher. And I, I really appreciate this. And I must admit, I, I, I really don't have an answer. 
You are absolutely correct. This is the first thing that struck me that you are planning to have 20 million dwelling units. Okay? How, what percentage do you allocate to vertical 1, vertical 2, vertical 3, vertical 4? It's not clear. Because they do not know which one will succeed. You see, they have mentioned 18 million will be for slums. That means the first and the first one should have 18 million. That has not taken off. You see, what has taken off is the last one. And that is, you know, because of first thing, in 2015 they announced the LIG people will get 6 lakhs, EWS will get 3 lakhs loan. It didn't take off. Then, Prime Minister himself announced that no, no, we'll relax the limit to 6 lakhs and uh, 9 lakhs for the LIG people. Then, some movement took place. And now, recently, on 1st of January, they have issued two MIG schemes, MIG 1, MIG 2, and even up to 12 lakhs, you can get loans. So, now they know that the proportion is going to shift to the fourth vertical. If they would have mentioned that to start with, then that would have been violated. I have a feeling they don't have a clear road map. They are not very sure how much will come from the first, second, third, fourth component. And that's why the data is not freely coming. But certainly, this is a very, very important question that what is government's thinking about the four heart verticals con contributing to the 20 million housing shortage? Sir, There's here, one more question. There's going to be the last question. Here to your, this hotel, we have about uh, 10 acres of uh, slum. It is called Chegachula. Earlier, we used to have small, small huts. When AK Anani became the chief minister, they constructed two-story buildings and all that. But there were proposals from private sector, as well as government and private sector together to construct large housing on one side and give free houses to all these people. Free houses to the entire population staying there. But because of the political reasons and objection from the local community and various other problems, this is not happening in the city. These are some of the practical problems you are facing, especially the uh, western interest of the, uh, uh, the local people as well as the uh, political interest coupled with the western interest of the local people sabotage the entire scheme. This is happening. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution for this? No, I, th I think this is an important question that if you have a slum where 1000 households are living, they are living in a very congested area but perhaps the same space if you build two-storied or three-storied, you can accommodate all the house, households and still have some floors left for cross-subsidization. You said houses can be given free. Yeah, yeah. They are giving, surrendering the land and you take care of the cost. It is not completely free because you are getting one lakh now. Right? You are saying it is possible to get a slum area and accommodate all the houses in a reasonably comfortable manner with 300 square feet and make two-storied, three-storied structure. But now you are getting one lakh of subsidy. Plus, you are also getting some extra TDR. There itself, and if not there, you get it somewhere else. Should it not be possible to really provide houses free? Because now you are getting extra one lakh and TDR facility. That is an issue. But other question that you are saying, that the if you take PPP, Public -pri Private Partnership for Affordable Housing, you take up a new area, build 5,000 houses, and you want to get government subsidy, what can you do? 35% of the houses should be made for the EWS category. Then you get 1.5 lakh for each EWS house as a subsidy. Only these houses will be priced you will get a price for them also, but you will get a price which is fixed by the state government. And the state government will decide who will get it. Now, I have a feeling you can cross-subsidize. If you are given l lower cost, lower price, you are forced to sell the EWS houses, even with 1.5 lakh of subsidy, you are supposed asked to sell at 3 lakhs. 1.5 lakh is not enough. You can charge that money to the other 65%. You can make money from there. Now what would happen, the richer sections of the people will say, if we are paying 8 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 
or maybe 20 lakhs. We don't want these poor people to live nearby. You push them in the co other corner. There may be segmentation. That is a problem. In a PPP model, I have a feeling that if you charge high prices from the middle class and very cheap prices for EWS, the middle class will say, we do not want these people to live very close. There can be segmentation and that is an issue which needs to be addressed. I'm afraid due to time constraints, we have to wind up the interactive session. So thank you very much, sir. Now I would request uh, Sri Reguchandran Nayar, former National Vice President Credal, to hand over a memento to a distinguished speaker as a token of our deep respect and heartfelt gratitude. So dear dignitaries, on and off the days in case as we approach the conclusion of it, another enlightening and thought-provoking lecture from beyond square feet. Let me thank you one and all for honoring us with your presence, triggering positive interactions and introspections, as well as supporting us in this venture. Let me take this opportunity to thank personally and on behalf of Asset Homes, Professor Dr. Amitabh Kundu for being here with us today to share with us his thoughts and experiences and for his very passionate, brilliant speech. With these words, let me mark the close of today's events. Let's part today with a commitment to take conscious action to make space for one and all. Thank you for your valuable presence and positive participation. Good night till we meet again. Let's now rise for the national anthem.